Welcome to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, transformative studies in the Word of God. I'm Pastor John Harris, and this is my podcast. Our topic today is on the devil's devices. I bet you've thought about that. How does the devil work? How can he get a hold of you? Can he can he cause you to sin? Can he take you over? How's he working the lost? You know, the Bible has much to say about it. We're going to open up the Word and check it out. Join me over the next few weeks as we open up this study and find out what God's Word has to say about the devil. Take your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. God says that there's a battle going on. It's not against flesh and blood. And I want you to make sure you understand that. As we look at how, uh, we're going to see how uh, uh, we're attacked tonight from, by, by the, the unbelievers, those that don't know Christ, and how Satan uses them. And the issue is, you got to understand, he uses them, their pawns, uh, to, to, attack, to attack believers. And when it's not a battle against them, it's not a battle against your neighbor, it's not a battle against your boss, it's a battle against something that's behind the scenes. It's, it's this, it's Ephesians chapter 2 says that the spirit that worketh and the children of disobedience is his spirit, the prince of the power of the air. And so we need to remember that as we go down and look at some of these things. Go over to um, uh, Acts 26. I told you to grab it there. I don't have it yet, but Acts 26. Look at what the Lord Jesus Christ told Paul when he met him on the road to Damascus. Paul's repeating this statement, and uh, he's uh, rehearsing what, uh, what had occurred. And we'll start in Acts 26, look at verse 15. And he says uh, this, Acts 26, verse 15. And I said, he's talking, Paul says, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. Notice what it says there, verse 18. And here's the purpose to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from what? The power of Satan, what? Unto God. And it tells you how. That they may receive, what? The forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by how? Faith that is in me. The purpose that Paul was out there, Christ told Paul, was the, the purpose is to deliver, to rescue people from the power of Satan. See, Satan has power. I mean, that Satan is working in the unbelievers, right? He has power with the unbelievers. He works in those who are that are in darkness. They're stumbling around in darkness, and he 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 uses them, and and he and he and he and he, and he, and he causes them to do his will. Look again at Ephesians two. How does Satan do that? How does he get somebody to do his will? Well, he's the spirit that works in them. Where in time past, Ephesians two two. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. His spirit works in them. Well, how does he cause them to do his will? Well, it has a lot to do with perception. Perception. Perception is how we perceive things, right? We, we, we see something a certain way. I guess you can't use that to define it, right? Can't use perceive to, per, to define perception. Perception is how you, how you see things. And what Satan does is he works through his spirit and their spirit to let them see something a certain way. And I'll show you what I mean in a second here as we go look at some of the things that, that, uh, uh, that occurred, occurred to Paul. And there's, there's an interesting path, and maybe you've been attacked before. And what, you're gonna, what we're going to look at is the fact that Satan attacks in two different ways. Okay? First, we read in Ephesians chapter 6 that he has wiles, he has tricks. Okay? He uses methods, different types of methods, to carry out his uh, carry out his tasks. Okay, and he uses his angels to motivate the lost to change their perception about you. Have you ever had somebody just not like you? Just you know, it's like I didn't do anything to that person. I, I got people at work that just don't like me. Okay, I've done nothing to them. In fact, I've been very nice to them, but they really don't like me. Okay, why is that? I'm, I'm a nice guy. 
Okay, I'm, I'm really not that, you know, I'm not overbearing. At least, well, Fanny might say something different about that, but, you know, it's, I'm not that, I mean, there's some people just don't like me. Okay? And maybe you have that too. And, and a lot of them, a lot of people, or where people I work with, I guess. And it's because they think, they, they think something about me. It's not me. See, they have a perception. They perceive something. But it's not reality. Okay? And Satan helps them, encourages them, causes them to perceive something interesting about you or I. Uh, go to Acts 13. Remember, it's not a flesh and blood issue. Not a flesh and blood issue. Acts 13. We're going to go down through a couple of ver- chapters. We'll stay in Acts here for a little bit. And um, first thing you'll see is something interesting. And maybe if you just think about the times that somebody has just like, why are they doing this to me? Because Satan's behind the scenes. His host. you got to remember, it's, when I say Satan, really I'm talking about Satan and his angels. Satan particularly probably doesn't care about you or I. He's a little busy. But, he, but his angels may be involved in it. And uh, look what it says here in Acts 13, verse 41. It says, Behold, here's the Apostle Paul. He's, he's been talking for a while. And he's talking to the Jews, but they, they were not listening to him. He says, Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Verse 42, And when the Jews were going out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, Many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God, God's grace. Verse 44, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. And verse 45 sort of lays out how Satan does frontal assaults, how he comes at you and hits you hard. Okay, Some people get knocked down with frontal assault. Some people are prepared for that, and they defend themselves quite well. But then he comes at it from a different way. It's a subtle attack. He has two ways. Major ways, he has a frontal assault, and the other one's a sneak attack. And we're going to look at both of them. Here's the frontal assault. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, what's the next phrase say? Verse 45. They were filled with what? Envy. The very first response of an unbeliever with you as a believer is envy. Satan caused them to perceive something, and they envy they, um, especially if you're standing, okay, you got to be standing. If you're acting just like they are, they're not going to envy anything. But if you're standing, as you're doing things God's way, they're going to see something different. Is that right? You know what? And because you're different, you're rubbing it in their face. Okay? That's the envy part. You're rubbing, you know, I don't go to certain places that some of the people where I work go. Okay? And because I don't go and they ask me, and I don't go where they go, all of a sudden I'm somehow too good for them, right? So they perceive I'm proud. I'm too good for them. And what do you do? What's the flesh want to do to a proud person? What do you want to do? Knock them down, right? Knock them down. Take their feet out from underneath them, right? They begin to envy. They, they see something. And, it, and what Satan does helps per, let them perceive that somehow you're proud because you're different. You know you're different and you're too good for us. Okay, they, maybe they see your peace. Maybe they see your light. They see something they don't have. And, and part of them wants it. But you know, there's two ways of getting it. Okay? If they want something you have, what they can try to do is take it, or they can remove it from you. Okay, if you have it, and if they can't somehow take it, then let's remove it from you. You got peace? I'll make sure it's not that peaceful for you. Why, why does it happen? Well, first, they begin to envy. There's something that you and I have in Christ that they don't. So what Satan does, he influences them. It causes them to perceive a personal issue. You have a personal they have a they have a personal issue with you, and I'm going to try. We're going to try to take you out. See, you're rubbing it in their face. Say you're different. So that must mean that you're too much. You're too you're too you're too proud, and 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 you begin to bother them. And while something bothers you, you try to brush it off. Step two, Acts 13, verse 45. First, they're filled with envy. And then the next thing is to do the following. And spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, next phase, contradicting. Beginning to contradict you, to, uh, to uh, point out. Have you ever had somebody point out your flaws? Say, uh, you know, like, uh, you say you're a Christian? And you do what? It doesn't matter what they do. 
but they point out your flaws. They point out, they point out the fact you laughed at that joke. You didn't have to say it. You laughed at it. They sold it. But see, you're a Christian. You're, you're different, but you act just like us. They hold you a higher standard. Right? So they begin to try to contradict you. Why would that be? Why would, how would that cause you to change, perhaps? Well, what it does is it, it tries to hold you back. If all of a sudden you feel that maybe I lost my testimony there, how are you going to be a witness? How are you going to uh, share? It's, what Satan's trying to do is stop you. He's trying to shut you up, trying to hinder you, make you feel discouraged to, to destroy you one way. Continue, verse, verse 45. And, what's the next verse, or next word? Blaspheming. See, if you're still standing after they've contradicted you, they've tried to shut you down through a variety of, of comments or uh, statements against you and pointing out who you are, that you're just like they are, and you know, hey, why don't you just come along with us anyways, because you're not really that big anyways, then they begin to blaspheme. That means they go openly and straight against God and what he clearly says. They will lie, they will cheat, they will slander, they will uh, do whatever it takes in the end, if you're still standing, to try to destroy you. They can. It can go that far. Okay? Until you stop. That's what they have in there. Let's go on and take a look, uh, by the way. And at any point along the path, it may just be one person initially, at any point along the path, they'll try to bring some other people along with it. Look out at verse 50 of Acts 13. So you have the one person, for some reason, you just rub them the wrong way. It's a person that somehow is very much in tune with, with Satan. And, and, they, and, and Satan causes them to envy. And then they begin to come at you. And then they'll, they can actually lie and slander and everything like that. It's interesting what they can do. If you're standing. If you're not standing, you might get left alone. Yea, all that live godly, what? Shall suffer persecution. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. If you're standing. Look at Acts 15, 13, verse 50. But the Jews, so it continues on, they, what? Stirred up, what? The devout and honorable women. And, what? The chief men of the city. And raised, what? Persecution. Anytime along the path, as they're trying to stop you from standing. By the way, are they trying to stop you from standing? No, they're just envious. They've, they've been motivated to feel a certain way. It's Satan trying to take you out. See, it's a spiritual battle. Okay? It's not the person. And by the way, and if you're aware of that, it won't bother you as bad. Okay? Because they're not attacking you. They're attacking your Savior for whom you're standing. They will bring in a brunch, a group, and they go after women a lot. Women and chief men. You know, you go after the big ones. Exactly what Satan did back in the, back. our first lesson was talk about what happened in heavenly places. Satan led a rebellion. So who did he go after? Did he go after the low angels? He went after the chief angels. Get them to follow you. Okay? They can do more damage, right? See, if your boss doesn't like you, it's sort of hard to work for them, right? Go over to Acts 17. By the way, then they bring the chief women and the, or the women and the, and the, and the chief men and they bring a persecution, a multifaceted attack. It comes from all directions. And what if you, if you're not aware that you're in a battle, it's like, whoa, it will shut you down. It will stop you. But see, if you're aware you're in a battle and that you're standing for your Lord and Savior, you know what? You can stand there. And you can continue to stand because God's with you. And He takes the assault. You just stand there. Look at Acts 17, verse 5. Notice what it starts out with again. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, they worked with individuals they would never even think about hanging out with. It's called blasphemy. They, they, went, they, went, they, 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 would, they used anything to try to take Paul out. They, they, they got some, and, and by the way, then they, they gathered, a, say the basis sword, and they gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar. Get a whole bunch together. Okay, work with, it, you know, work with unholy alliances. So they'll do anything sometimes, depends on how much you're standing. Look at Pastor Culp and all the attacks that he has suffered. Stand. And look at, look, at, look at the groups that came together. Maybe some of you remember more than even I remember than I know. And the attacks that happened. 
Individuals who stand will be attacked. It's a guarantee. And Satan uses frontal assault sometimes. Look at verse 14, chapter 14, Acts 14, verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, and what's it say there? Who persuaded the people. There's always a, there's always a leader, somebody who's motivated, and they persuade others. And they persuade them for the variety of ways to persecute. What did they do to Paul here? They stoned them. Must have really got them riled up, right? Okay. Satan will use whatever to stop. By the way, you get stoned, you do get knocked down. Okay. But what did Paul do? What did Paul do? Stood up. Okay. He stood up, walked. He ran to the hills, right? What did he do? Verse uh, 20. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and did what? Came back into the city. How could he do that? Well, well, if it happened again, he'd stand back up again. Okay, It's God's task. God stood him up. Go do God's will. No problem. Okay, well, if that doesn't work, doesn't work, go to Acts chapter 19. So you have these that are coming at you. They're Somehow they're stirred up and they're raised to uh, envy. And then they stir up others who may not even know why. Acts 19, then comes religion. What's religion got to do with it? Well, religion is a blinder. It causes confusion. And Satan will use religion to confuse things just to get emotional energy. Okay, They don't like it. Acts chapter 19, verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of, the, of like occupation, and said, Sirs, you know how that by this craft we have our wealth. Well, first thing is, he says, he goes after the pocketbook and says, hey, we get our money from this. Moreover, ye see in here, verse 26, that not alone at Ephesus, but also throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only is this our craft is, is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these things, saying, these, these sayings, they were what? Full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of, Eph of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with what? Confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. They were, it caused confusion, it caused energy, it caused all kinds of things. And it's, most of them didn't even know what was going on. But they just knew that that Paul was a problem. Well, it started with one man, right? One man. But that one man was motivated by somebody. He was envious. Paul was taking away his, his money, taking away a variety of things. Look at these statements from Paul. Go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians. All the T's are together there. 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy. 2nd Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at some of the, one of the things here Paul prayed for. 2nd Thessalonians 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may be what? Delivered from unreasonable. You know any unreasonable people? And what? Wicked men. For all men have not what? Faith. He's talking about those out there in the world. There are those who are unreasonable. The reason they're unreasonable is because they can't see it any other way because they're envious. It gets in the way. Jealousy blinds. Envy blinds. And Satan causes it to blind. And wicked men. Those who will just be, do whatever to, to, to uh, carry out their task. Look at 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy is right after 2 Thessalonians there. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 14, how would you like to have this said about you? <laughs> you know, I wouldn't, at uh, the judgment day, I don't think I'd want to have this particular statement made about me. Here's in the Word of God, a man's name. Alec, or 2 Timothy 4, verse 14. Paul says, Alexander the coppersmith did me what? Much evil. You know, well, that, th there was a particular individual that was really a problem to Paul in his life. Alexander the coppersmith was one of, is, was one of them. He did him much evil. He was one of those wicked men Paul's said, delivering from. But what Paul says, the Lord reward him according to his works. See, Paul know that it's not his battle. It's the Lord's battle. And the Lord will reward him according to his works. Go over to 1 Thessalonians 2. Look at verse 18. 
Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. But what happened there? But Satan hindered us. Now, how did Satan hinder Paul from getting to the Thessalonians? Did somehow some strange force field show up? How did Satan hinder Paul? Unreasonable people, wicked people. The lost being motivated to uh, uh, stand in his way, to confront him. Okay. See, what Satan's involved in is trying to, especially through the lost is unbelieving unbelievers, is to take you out of the battle, to stop you, to hinder you, to uh, discourage you. Okay, You know, if you uh, stand up, you know, that's what God asks you to do. Arise from the dead. Redeem the time. Stand up. Get in the battle. Share the gospel once. And wham, you get hit real hard and get knocked on your back. That's a little discouraging, right? They'll try to do that. Okay, or, or you try to be a testimony where you work or where you, or where you play or, or at a, where you go to eat. Now, it's easy in here. It's real easy in here. It's real hard outside those walls. And when you go out there and you get hit hard, it can discourage you. It can hinder you. It could uh, knock you down, make you fear. You know, if you, uh, if you by, in, by the way, inside these walls too. You know, you serve on a board. You do some task. You know, there's lots of people who can tell you how to do it really well. You, know, you, you should be doing it this way. Well, they're not doing it. You're doing it. Okay. Well, lots of people can tell you how to do it, and it can discourage you. Okay. Well, we're talking about believers there. Oh, uh oh. It's next week. He'll try to distract you. You have a purpose, right? If you're too involved trying to defend yourself, how much work do you get done? What's to try to cause you to turn and run, to shut you up, and eventually try to destroy you? And one method he uses is a frontal assault, which is a very blatant attack. You know when it's occurred, okay? You feel the stripes. It happens. But understand, it's from him. It's not the people. Feel sorry for him. Okay? Paul says... Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord, right? The Lord will revenge. The Lord will avenge. He will take care of the details. You just keep on keeping on. Before I talk about some of the subtle attacks here, I just want to read something to you. I forgot to read it here a little bit ago. Last week we were talking about um, those filled with the Spirit. And uh, I sort of talked a little bit about uh, the special class, these like psychics and stuff, and how they're getting in tune with somebody. I got an email that night. It was interesting. I want to read this to you. It's a junk mail. Okay, this goes straight into the delete bin. And for some reason, by the way, mo all my junk mail is tagged, and so it usually just goes in. I never even see it. But this one somehow slipped through. Let me read this to you. I think it's interesting. Because it tells you exactly what those involved in being psychics and, uh, well, let's read it. It says, online psychics specializing in astrology, numerology, tarot, Runes and channelings from angels and spirit guides. It says this new amazing this amazing new site offers the best new age content. We offer online readings in private chat rooms or by phone, email readings, angel readings, dream interpretation, past life readings, channelings to the other side. Uh, he said you will find gifted spiritual counselors that are clairaudient, which means I think they hear things for you, clairvoyant. They perceive things that you can't see. Clairsentient, they know things that you can't know. And ESP. We specialize, I thought this was interesting, in comprehensive prophecy that will enable you to, I don't know, this is some statement, self-heal through intuitive insights involving karma and dharma. I think it's threw a bunch of words together. But, but comprehensive prophecy, they, they, they want to predict the future for you. And who are they getting in contact with? Well, they get in talk, contact with angels. They do angel readings. They, they, they channel to the other side. Spirit guides. Well, they're working at it. And you know what? The angels they're contacting aren't anybody you want to meet. Okay? They're not going to be hanging around there much longer. It says there are goals to help you find inner peace. Now, where are you going to find inner peace? Not through that. You'll find it through the Lord Jesus Christ, but you won't find it there. But I thought that was interesting. It sort of fell in line with what we were talking about last time. Back to, back to Ephesians chapter 6. Back to Ephesians chapter 6. So I'm not really sure how that slipped through my filter, but uh, it usually checks for words like that. Astrology. You get all kinds of astrology garbage if you have email, amongst other things. Ephesians chapter 6 says, 
Put on the whole armor of God, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be, able, may be able to stand against the wiles, the methods, the expert methods, the tricks of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Satan has a variety of, of ways to come after you. One of them is a frontal assault. And the other method is one that you just don't see coming. Okay? Now, if you're standing, okay, typically... Typically, this one will not get you because a person who is standing typically is a person who is established. An individual that understands what God is doing, how God is working in their life. They have a, they, and that's how you stand. Romans 16, 25, 26, to be established, to understand the, what God's doing today, right? But there's also a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, what? Take heed, lest he fall. And it goes on to say about there's nothing comes into your life, right? There's no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation, what? Also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Okay. Take heed, lest you fall. The temptation is going to come. Tempt, tempt, the tempter is going to tempt. He's going to bring some things at you, and you need to be aware of it. Or you can fall. Subtle attacks. It's, I mean, by the way, you're very much aware somebody smacks you in the head with a brick, right? You figure that one out, okay? That's a frontal assault. It's the subtle ones where you're walking along, all of a sudden, wham, your feet go off from underneath you, and then you're trapped. The other way that Satan works is by deceiving, by ensnaring, by capturing, by seducing, by uh, uh, beguiling, is the words. And finally, the one he likes to do is to spoil. He likes to spoil you. What spoil means is to take from you that which is yours. And he has you. And when he has you, he has you. You can do anything that any unbeliever can do. You know that? You can do anything that any unbeliever can do. Ephesians 6 there, verse 12 says, For we what? What's the next word there? Wrestle. Have you ever seen uh, the Summer Olympics? We just have the Winter Olympics going on right now, right? Summer Olympics, uh, they have wrestling. They have Greco-Roman wrestling. Okay, and I'm, I'm, what I'd like to do for next week is to read up on it a little bit. But Greco-Roman wrestling is not necessarily like high school wrestling. It's, there's some analogies like it. But there is a task. You start out doing what? They're standing, right? What's the object? Take your opponent and knock them down or take them outside the ring. I think of Greco-Roman, you have to throw them out of the ring. Okay? Throw them out of the ring, I think, is the idea. You knock them out, there's points. You put them on their back, it's points. Well, we wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, right? We're wrestling. So what's Satan want to do to you? He wants to throw you out of the ring. He wants to knock you down, put you on your back. And when you're on your back, you're helpless. You're helpless. And that's what he wants to do. By the way, we wrestle, so guess what? You can do that, the opposite too. You can do the same thing. You can throw him out of the ring. Okay, it's called redeeming the time. You can put him on his back so he can't do anything in your life at all. We wrestle. We wrestle. Let's look at a couple verses and we'll end here. Colossians 2. Let's look at a couple things. We have, it's not a flesh and blood battle. It's against Satan. And by the way, he uses, Satan and his host, he uses people. And so this is how he does these things, but it's, it's subtle. And some things that eh, maybe it won't get you, Pastor Colby used to talk about, that when he talked about, uh, he has a series of messages called High Level Temptations. There's a book, there's a booklet up here. Uh, Ruth uh, Lockwood typed it up. And uh, not everybody's tempted by the same thing, you know. Uh, I've never been tempted by alcohol in my life, or smoking, or anything like that. Never, never once even tried it. I don't even know what beer tastes like. Never, never did it. Never had it, never even had a desire. Not a temptation. But everybody has something they're tempted by, okay. And so Satan watches you, studies you, and he works at those things. So what might tempt you? You know, college students, uh, we have, you know, we got a young people here, and they go to way of college. Okay, what, what's, what's the big temp one of the big temptations at universities? They try to affect their thinking, right? We have a lot of people get changed by philosophies and psychologies and, and things like that, and they come back and they get sometimes messed up. They think differently. They think wrong. High school, what do they work? What's the big, uh, what's the pseudoscience that they teach? Evolution—it's a—it's a—it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a God, humanism, 
It's a God. And it changes people. It's called beguiling. It changes how you think. And you take your eyes off the Lord. Look at Colossians 2. And we'll read on verse 18. And then we'll read verse 8. Here's the one that deals with the psychics. Okay, God's Word speaks about everything. Colossians 2, verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward, as trick you out of your reward, in a, what? Voluntary humility and worshiping of what? Angels. Hey, get those angels in, you know. Let them be supreme in your life. Let them tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. And God, we already know what's going to happen tomorrow. God's already got that dealt with, right? He's in control. It says, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up, what? By his fleshly mind. You know, sort of almost like Saul, right? Saul uh, stepped away from God, and he didn't see any insight anymore. He wasn't getting anything. So what is he wanted to go find out? So he wanted to check out the other side. Do it not God's way. And you know, what was God's reaction to Saul? It was no longer useful to him. Verse 19 says, you see, you're not looking right. And not holding the head, that's Christ, from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with an increase of God. So let no man beguile you. You know what? There will be those that will try to trick you. I get email all the time from this. I just read you one. Okay? It's voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Go back to Colossians 2, verse 8. By the way, that's being vain. It's empty. It's something of your fleshly mind. But God, maybe it doesn't attack, but maybe it doesn't tempt you. But it will some. Might tempt your children. By the way, you're established. These don't tempt you as well. Look at verse 7 says. Rooted. Go over, sorry, verse 6. As you therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That's by faith. Rooted and built up in him. So you're established. Established in the faith. As you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, so you're standing, but you beware, because take heed, you could fall. Beware, lest any man spoil you through what? Philosophy and vain, that's empty, profitless deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not what? After Christ. Going after uh, things, uh, man's wisdom, things that basically talk about like pseudoscience. Sciences aren't really sciences. Paul talks about in 1 Timothy 6.20 is uh, science falsely so-called. Uh, universities and, and uh, colleges do that. Now, I teach at a college, okay? I don't teach pseudoscience, okay? I, uh, but uh, there are those who do. I, we had a, had a meeting one time, and I actually got the, the pleasure, quote, of sitting at the guest speaker's table, and he was a philosophy, he was a philosopher, and he made this statement, which was interesting. He said, "I used to believe in God, but then he convinced himself otherwise." And uh, I looked at him and said, "I still do," and he had a shocked look on his face. And he had a, a little bit of a discussion before he went on to better and smarter people than than me, because I believed in God. Pseudos, traditions of men, vain deceit, philosophy, rudiments of the world, not after Christ. Beware, because you can fall. Maybe it's not the temptation that gets you. Maybe it's not the subtle attack he uses on you. We're going to go down through it. You will find something that will perhaps be how Satan might try to come after you. Let's pray. You've been listening to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, transformative studies in the Word of God. I hope you've enjoyed the study. Please subscribe, like, and comment. This podcast is available on many podcast platforms. Just search on the title. Now, until next time, fight the good fight of faith and God's best to you.